Hey everyone, I'm Su Yuan from MongoDB. Uh, in this talk, let's go through the journey of designing and model checking the reconfig protocol um, of MongoDB replication. MongoDB is a database, as you know. Um, it ensures fault tolerance with a consensus protocol. The consensus protocol is similar to Raft, but with some differences. Um, let's talk about some technologies that will be used throughout this talk. So all nodes in the replica set um, store the same data. And there is, there is one primary that can write, that can write into the op log, and all the other secondaries replicate newer op log entries from the primary and from each other. Um, when there's no primary, a secondary can run for an election for a higher term. Um, a secondary becomes a primary by collecting votes from the majority of the nodes. So, no, so only one node can become a primary in the given term. An op-log entry is committed when it's replicated to a majority of the nodes within the primary's term. So overall, we guarantee the safety property that committed rights will be safe even if some nodes fail. So here is an example of the op-log entry. The most interesting fields are the term and the timestamp. Timestamp is like a sequence number in Raft. The tuple of the term and the timestamp identifies, identify an op log entry and it defines which entry is newer. A config defines the membership of a replica set. Sometimes it's necessary to add or remove some nodes via a process called reconfig. For example, one may need to remove offline nodes or add more nodes for read scalability. As you saw earlier, the correctness of the consensus protocol is based on the idea of majority. However, when adding and removing nodes, the definition of majority is changing. This is very challenging to ensure the system correctness during reconfig. Reconfig is very hard to design there was a critical safety bug in an early version of Raft protocol. So originally, MongoDB had a legacy reconfig protocol. It's a gossip-based protocol. There are heartbeats. So in this protocol, only the primary can write reconfig, and each config has a user-defined version. Nodes learn nodes learned of the latest config from each other. Upon learning a higher config, it was immediately installed and took effect on that node. The Lexi protocol worked well in most scenarios, but it was known to be unsafe in certain cases. The protocol also had a mode called, called force reconfig. In this mode, it allows a user to install a new configuration even if a man a majority of the nodes are offline, and there is no primary. This feature is needed by on-prem customers because even when a majority of nodes are down, they may still want to get the system back to operation knowing the risk of losing some recent data. So we wanted a safe reconfig protocol. Initially, we considered Raft's reconfig protocol. It's based on the log. There is an entry in the log to indicate the new config, but this is not compatible with force reconfig. If we want to support both, we have to maintain both log-based and gossip-based implementations. How could we ensure the two protocols don't interfere with each other, and upgrade and downgrade will be very complex? Instead, we hoped to develop a new protocol that minimizes changes to the legacy protocol and support force reconfig. This goal was inspired by Raft's safety rules for reconfig. We were wondering, can we adopt those rules in a heartbeat-based protocol? Those rules seemed pretty simple. The first means that only a single node change is allowed at each time. If you want to add two nodes, you can add them separately, one by one. The second rule is that 
a new config is only accepted when previous config is committed. When we first came up with those ideas, it was uncertain to us how to guarantee the correctness. We wanted to leverage TLA plus and model checking. In 2019, the replication team already had some experiences with TLA plus and model checking, but on smaller problems. Without a crystal ball, we have to give it a try. We modeled the, the legacy protocol by adding two actions, reconfig and send config, to the existing replication spec. This start and propagate a new configuration. In the reconfig action, we introduce the rule for the single node change. The rule ensures that any majority of adjacent configs always overlap with each other. As an example, a majority of three is two and a majority of four is three. So in this case, they overlap at the second node. This node is the key to ordering events. To our surprise, we reproduced a known bug with just 150 lines of code change on the first day. It was very successful. So let's dive into the TLA plus code. To run reconfig, a node has to be a primary and only a single node can be changed. It's interesting that the code here is actually inaccurate. It only checks the size of the new config and not its membership. However, the violation trace turned out to be a valid failure. The code was fixed later. Another key question about model checking was what safety properties should we check? We care about two safety properties. We care that we never elect two primaries in the same term and we never roll back committed op log entries. So with all this effort on the spec and the safety properties, on day one, model checking was able to reproduce a violation trace in seconds, and the bug was obvious. Here's the trace. At the beginning, we have three nodes. The interesting states are highlighted in bold, and different, uh, different configs are in different colors. In this state, both N1 and N2 are primaries, but they are in different terms, so this is totally fine. N1 removes one node in the first reconfig, and then N1 removes another node. Now we have a problem. The stale primary N1 has accepted two configs in a row to become a single node replica set by itself. However, the other two nodes may not be aware of those changes and will behave as if the stale primary were down. So as a result, the replica set split into two independent ones. This leads to two possible primaries in the same term, violating the safety guarantee. We knew the first attempt would probably not work, but it's exciting to see that model checker was able to find a counterexample in seconds. This breakthrough gave us a lot of confidence to iterate the new design. Single node change was easy, but it's unclear what config commitment means outside of the op log. However, um, sorry, uh, because the configs are only propagated via heartbeats, it's natural to borrow some concepts from Raft on log commitment. We focused on this problem on day two and day three. After a few iterations, we added the quorum checks for terms and config versions to the reconfig action. We checked that the primary is still valid by compar comparing its term with a majority of the nodes. We also check a majority of the nodes have the same config versions as the primary. In TLA Plus, on day three, we modeled the two quorum checks for terms and config versions. When both of them are satisfied for some quorum, we say, the config is safe. And as you can see, config is safe is a part of the reconfigs conditions. As we continued to refine the protocol, it took longer and longer for the model checker 
to find the counterexamples. We knew we were moving in the right direction. We kept the model checker running overnight. However, this isn't the final answer to config commitment, and we'll see why in a minute. While the model checker was running, on day three, we found another counterexample when examining an edge case in Raft. We wanted to see what would happen in our protocol. On day four, we realized this problem turned out to be at the core of the relationship between the op log and the config. Raft puts the config in the op log, so it establishes an implicit ordering between the op log entries and the configs. However, our protocol has lost this dependency. We tried to add a rule to capture the ordering between them, but the first version didn't work well. We reproduced this counterexample with model checking, and let's go through the trace. Initially, we had a three node replica set. When one is the primary, it commits a write by replicating it to two nodes. The primary adds a new node and propagates the config to all four nodes. The primary adds one more node and propagates the latest config to all five nodes. Now something wrong happens. N3 becomes a primary and commits a new write in term two. That will cause both N1 and N2 to roll back the previously committed oblog entry in term one, violating the safety guarantee. The root problem here is that when we were about to add the last node, we already have four nodes. However, the op-log entries on the first two nodes haven't been committed in the four node config, even though they were committed in the three node config. We should ensure that the op-log commitment in previous configs is also respected in the current config. We need to explicitly check this property before accepting a new config. In TLE Plus, we added a check of op committed in config. Um, it is expressed as enabled commit entry. Commit entry is an action that marks the last op log entry on primary as committed. So enabled means um, we we are, uh, we are able to commit this according to the current config, even though it doesn't really actually, it doesn't actually take the action. With all of this, we solved the relationship between the op log and the config. On day five, after running on a powerful EC2 instance for about a day, the model checker produced another counterexample. Let's go through another trace at a high level. Initially, N1 is the primary, and it removes a node. N2 becomes the new primary in the higher term and removes a different node. Again, this is totally acceptable. N1 propagates its config, but steps down because it sees a higher term. However, N1 didn't give up, and it becomes the primary again in term three. N2 continues to propagate its config to N4. Now a problem arises. The replica set split into two configs. Each of them has their own majorities available. So each config can, can elect a new primary in the same term. That violates the safety guarantee. So when examining the counterexample, we realized that when a node when a node moves to a new config, it should have ensured that in the future, no primaries would ever be elected in previous configs, so that earlier configs are deactivated. On day five, we finally realized that agreeing on the config among the nodes was a separate consensus problem. It is separate from the op log consensus. This was the aha moment for us. The config itself 
is a degraded, replicated state machine. It doesn't require the history because only the last config takes effect. But it's still a consensus problem. There are a lot of similarities between the two consensus. The similarity suggests that using the config version to identify a config was not sufficient. We need to identify a config with the tuple of config term and config version and order the configs by those tuples. The election of two consensus protocols can be merged together by comparing config terms and versions in addition. We answered the question of op-log commitment to. When an op-log, sorry, when, uh, we, we answered the question of config commitment. When a config is propagated to a majority of nodes in the primary term, the config is committed. There was an interesting nuance when it comes to election because the config on a new primary was learned earlier and not committed by itself. So the, pro the primary must write its current config again with its late latest term and commit it. This behavior is similar to the no op entry on step up in raft. Model checking found a violation in seconds without this change. This, the failure trace was very similar to a bug found in an early version of raft reconfig protocol. Through this journey from day one, we optimized the specs multiple times. We removed the voting states, tuned the initial states, fixed the disparity with the implementation, and we focused on the simpler election safety property. Overall, we made model checking much faster so that we can check a larger model. Additionally, we simulated shutdown. This extended the state, st state spaces significantly. Now we have gained a lot of confidence in our approach. Liveness was particularly interesting because combining the elections of two consensus restricts the behavior of the system. For example, we allow config propagation without a primary. So a node can accept a config with a lower term even if it has voted for a higher term. This is not allowed in Raft for log replication, but this is allowed in MongoDB for both log replication and, um, and config propagation. Besides, we thought we could tighten a rule to avoid some complexity, but it turned out that liveness was impacted, even though all safety checks passed. Thanks to model checking, we were able to find the bug quickly. Eventually, we were able to get a draft protocol in a week. We iterated at least four versions in the first few hours. It was exciting to see our vague ideas turn into something tangible. Within two weeks, we finalized the protocol and passed both safety and liveness checks. The scope of the implementation became much smaller because it shared a lot with the existing protocol. We delivered the project in three months with three to four developers. Fourth reconfig was implemented using the same mechanism, but with less, uh, with uh, relaxed rules. We made upgrade and downgrade simpler too. Will Shots added a correctness proof and a formal verification afterwards. Finally, the new protocol was released in MongoDB 4.4 in 2019. It has been very, very reliable in production since then. Through this journey, we had some takeaways. Model checking is a great tool for answering what if questions and allows fast iteration. In this talk, we have gone through a few major design choices, but in fact, we, ex we experimented with many more small changes. The model checker found bugs in seconds initially on a laptop and eventually overnight on a powerful workstation. Model checking also helped us to reason about the system critically and quickly. 
even though model checking can find counterexamples, it's still a human's job to abstract the key properties, reason about its correctness, and brainstorm solutions. Whenever we came up with a new theory, we would test it against the counterexamples found by model checking. Writing specs in TLA plus rather than text also forced us to think rigorously. Some edge cases such as the op-lock dependency were found by developers. Their solutions were later confirmed by model checking. We didn't find any bug of the protocol for cases covered by the spec. However, we did find bugs in the implementation during testing. Because the spec was abstract and didn't cover concurrency. For example, step down is an atomic step in the spec, but it's a complex procedure in implementation. It requires multiple lock acquisition and releases and involves multiple database writes. When it comes to force reconfig, the correctness guarantees no longer apply because it goes beyond the spec. At MongoDB, we made sure that unsafe reconfig never occurs in MongoDB Atlas, which is our hosted MongoDB as a service. We focused on the intuition of the new protocol and the experience of using model checking in this talk. We published the paper about the protocol. We'll publish another paper for its formal verification. The specs can be found online. So that's all, thank you so much. Thank you, and we'll be uploading the slides so you'll be able to access those links um, after the conference as well. Do we have questions? Um, I noticed that there was timestamps used between the different nodes. Did you have a global clock or run into, you know, frequently you get run into issues with time across different nodes, so I was wondering if that was actually tested, considered, solved, et cetera? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, in MongoDB, we do have timestamps, but it serves more like a sequence number rather than a clock. It's like a virtual clock. Um, so it's, uh, basically it composes two parts. Uh, the first one is um, the seconds, the epoch seconds, then the latter one is uh, a counter in that second. It is generated by the primary. Um, so it, it is okay if, uh, if the sequence number or the timestamp on a new primary is lower than the previous ones be because we have uh, the, the term, which we use the both term and timestamp to identify an op log. Um, so the ordering is guaranteed. Um, so we, it's, uh, the clock is, the, or the clock skew was never a problem for us. Um, and if our next speaker can meet me at the back of the room. Uh, I think you mentioned about uh, uh, proof and a formal verification. I'm wondering, is that down the same TR plus spec or a different uh, spec? Uh, it's, uh, I believe uh, the work was done by Will uh, during his PhD. Uh, actually, Will uh, initially worked on this project, and after that, he went to um, a graduate school for a PhD in formal verification and formal methods. Um, so uh, the formal verification proof was developed during that time. Uh, uh, I believe he developed a, a, a different TLA plus spec, but it was based on, or initially based on this one, at, at least inspired by this one. Uh, and both of the specs are available online. Any additional questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and we'll look forward to getting those slides online. Thank you. As well.